Total War Saga Troy comes out August 13th of this year. And in a brand new preview event, we'll be looking at the Spartan King Menelaus, as well as the Trojan Prince Paris. This is going to be a two-part video. Video one here today, we're going to be talking with Menelaus. And then the second video on Thursday, we'll be talking about Paris. And the way I'm going to do these videos or structure this video is I'm going to give you an overview of the campaign go over the campaign map, some of the really cool mechanics that they've added with Total War Saga Troy, and then give you my updated impressions on how I think this is actually kind of panning out. Uh, we did that original preview video back when we just had the Achilles and the Hector um, actual combat footage, so we won't be focusing as much on combat um, in these two videos. This is mainly going to be focused on campaign play, as I feel this is where Total War Saga Troy is really going to shine. So we're going to go through the opening like kind of character selection screen. We're going to look at the campaign from a turn one perspective. And then I'm going to jump forward like turn 15, 16, 17 around that area to kind of show you how the campaign progresses. This will be very similar to the series that I usually do on Is It Right For You? Covering whether or not a specific campaign is going to be right for you based off of certain principles or underlying themes of the campaign. While I will not ultimately be doing that because the game is not released yet and this might change, I will I will eventually do that when the game does come out. Let's go into Menelaus, the king of Sparta. Here we are, the faction select screen for Menelaus. And every single faction gets two specific faction mechanics, as well as some individual hero mechanics. Um, kind of a recommended playstyle that summarizes their faction in one easy kind of... Um, sentence as well as their unique faction units and this screen is very representative of what we get with total war warhammer 2 remember this is the total war warhammer 2 engine and when we jump into the actual game you're going to see a lot of the same ui elements and construction that you normally would when you're playing warhammer 2 but i gotta be honest with you the ui has been really fine-tuned to a to a really great way in Troy, and I think it's probably one of the biggest things for Troy, is that it tells me, okay, game three for Warhammer should have so many awesome elements about it when it comes to just on-screen organization. And we'll get, a, we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll, we'll jump to that later. But the two faction mechanics for Menelaus are Call to Arms and Spartan Colonies. And these, this is really cool. So Call to Arms works where anytime you have a defensive or military ally or alliance, you can recruit them from essentially what is a global recruitment pool. So you can call to arms um, a faction's units that you have no access to normally. So it's a really awesome way to get all these different types of units without having to conquer across the entire uh, Greek peninsula. On top of that, they get Spartan colonies, which is really cool. So anytime you see any of these little islands over here, anything like that, that is not colonized it does not have an actual inhabitant it's, it's a raised colony they can actually spend resources and the further away uh, the more resources it costs uh, to colonize that location instantly now uh, the only caveat to that is that you have to have line of sight or else it won't work so it, you can't just go ahead and colonize over here because you just want to do it so that's the only caveat to that and i think it's a pretty cool way to balance it so I really like that approach for Menelaus, Call to Arms and Spartan Colonies. And then you get these four hero types. Now, when we think heroes, when we look at Total War Warhammer, that nomenclature typically applies to someone that doesn't lead an, ar an army, right? Hero is an agent that we've seen in previous Total War games. Well, a hero in this case is a general. And Menelaus has no access to archer skirmishers. Every single character has one hero that they cannot access. So it kind of plays in line with the style of army and play style of that specific faction. And then for the exception of the archer, every single hero has three different delineations. So for example, we have the defender that is a protector, companion, or veteran. The veteran is a little bit more of a damage dealer. The companion is more of a support class and the protector is more of a outright tank. Then we look at the fighter champion, ravager, and vanquisher. Vanquisher being a lot more of a, like a glass cannon style DPS class. Ravager being someone that uses a lot of uh, CC or crowd control. And then champion being another character that is, uh, again, on the more tanky side, but still on the damaging end of that spectrum. Then we get the warlord as a mentor, commander, or warmonger. Mentor is more of a... I guess you could say governor, not only a commander, but an expert at managing territories. 
Uh, the commander is, again, a support style class, with the warmonger being one that seems to buff up allies and debuff the enemy. So, again, you get a really cool style of general with the heroes. This is very representative of what we get in Total War Warhammer 2 with, say, Vampire Coast. It doesn't just have um, just generic generals that you recruit. They all have kind of specific play styles geared around them, and I really like that. So Menelaus here is the king of Sparta, obviously starts in Sparta, and as thus he has special victory conditions. You've got two styles of objective, the Homeric victory or the Total War victory. Homeric just kind of plays in line with the character's uh, story from the Iliad. So you get this uh, um, goal to destroy Hector of Troy, Paris of Troy, and Troy itself, capture Helen, hold two settlements of Troy and Gnosis, um, and then defeat your first antagonist faction as well as do like your special mission line. And you get a total war victory here, which is pretty much exactly what you would expect. Paint the map. So um, it's a really interesting kind of uh, mechanic here because I like that you can either go through this with a heavy narrative approach or build your own approach for Menelaus. And I think it's going to make for um, a little bit more of an enjoyable play style with uh, the mighty king of Sparta. But let's jump into the actual game and look at some of the other mechanics on the map itself. Hey, spear famed Menelaus. Brazen Prince Paris of Troy has dared to steal your wife. Paris of Troy must pay! Gold-rich Mycenae, ruled by your brother Agamemnon, will support your cause. Troy thinks to slight me, but they will pay the price. As well as exacting vengeance upon Troy, other matters demand your attention. Open rebellion has devastated the region of Aetis, where a pretender is trying to take power for himself. South of Aetis, mighty Tyrins holds Kithara Island, blocking your access to the treasures of Crete which are beyond imagination. Consolidate your power at home. Urge Helen's suitors to honor the oath of Tyndarius in your defense, and wage war on the perfidious Trojan princeling. So here we start in the opening portions of what will eventually become the Trojan War. And the advisor talks about the oath of Tyndarius. And Tyndarius is the stepfather of Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy, you have to remember, is um, the uh, daughter of Zeus. Because, you know, the, the old Greek mythological trope of Zeus taking on the form of something and impregnating someone else. And Helen of Troy is that byproduct. So Tyndarius is actually pretty well linked to both Agamemnon and Menelaus, kind of re kind of instating them more or less as the successor Spartan kings to Tyndarius himself. Tyndarius was the former Spartan king uh, before stepping down and allowing Menelaus to take over that kingship. And furthermore, the oath of Tyndarius extends to all of the many suitors that approached Helen of Troy when she was but a single lass. And essentially, since Tyndarius had been approached by so many people, I think it was... Um, it was like Odysseus, Ajax, um, Diomedes, I think also Menelaus and Agamemnon, as well as in Domineus. And he pretty much said, you know, I'm not going to accept all of your, any of your gifts. Helen can choose, but whoever she chooses, I want there to be an oath that um, if there's any foul play that is exacted upon the suitor that is chosen, then that oath means that you will all rally and defend and, and basically protect that suitor and Helen's honor. And this is what actually kind of unifies all of Troy against, I'm sorry, all of um, the Greeks against Troy, or at least the, uh, the tribes that are allied with the, the uh, oath of Tyndarius. So this is where we start right now, right? And as I do that long-winded history lesson. And this is the UI, and I actually really dig the UI for Total War Saga Troy. It's, it's just way better than uh, Warhammer 2 and way better than 3K in my opinion. Um, it just feels very well oiled. Like everything is not so in your face 
all the time. The, the, you can see the map is down here on the right side. Um, you have all these effects up here on the left. You can see all of your new resources, which we'll go over in just a second. And you get all of the, basically, your objectives, your royal decree, which is your now technology, um, diplomacy, divine will, which we'll again go over, call to arms, and Spartan colonies. These last two are your faction-specific buttons, more or less. So I find the UI to be pretty minimalist, and I like that approach more so even than, than 3K, which I actually really, really liked the UI of. But since Total War Warhammer 2 is now so old, like three years old now at this point, they've really taken that formula and improved upon it. So I have to say I really do enjoy the overall feel of the UI. Now, looking at the actual army, it's going to look very similar to the playstyle of Total War Warhammer 2. Now, you, you, when you hover over these guys, even all of the monikers for armor, melee attack, melee defense, damage, charge bonus, everything is pretty much right in line. And you get this very representative, um, almost complete overhaul and mod of Warhammer 2. But let's take a look at Menelaus real quick. We'll click here on character details and we can see all of his battle effects and campaign effects that he gets. It's the traits of lineage, increasing his melee defense for all units and influence over a province. We're going to go in that in a little bit on um, the Homeric character, which is essentially uh, guarantees that he cannot be killed. He just gets wounded and he will come back. And uh, this character is designed for greatness. When killed in battle or due to agent action, they will only be wounded. An epic hero grants him an increased hero influence over provinces, 20% to generate rage in battle and 20 morale to heroes. And lastly, adventurer gives him a 5% to campaign movement range bonus, minus 20% to attrition from desertion and a 10% to battle speed of hero bonus. So all these special characters essentially are your, your mainstay, right? These are the guys that are going to be leading your faction. And as thus, they have a skill tree. Now, the skill tree is very different from previous um, Warhammer 2 or Warhammer games. It's more in line with what we get from previous Total War games, where choosing a path one way or another locks out the other one. I think it will say here, um, this will permanently lock the opposite skill and its specializations. So you get to really choose how you want to go down this list, completely blocking off the other. So you get three skills within each one major selection, I guess you could say. And it shows you at the top the individual color coding. So red is your ability, green is your units, blue is your campaign, and then, uh, I, I don't know, colorblind? But what is personal? Whatever color personal is. Yellow is personal. <laughs> As I look at it, I'm like, wait, what the hell? So you get these choices here, and you can see how that progresses on this gauge. So it's a pretty nifty little, um, little UI element there. Um, equipment here, though, is just the same as you would always expect. You have your um, shield, your hand weapon, your mount. You have different items that you're going to gain as you play through the game. Um, typical kind of standard fare there. Now, let's take a look at the new resource system. So if I press tab, I can see all of the provinces, cities, everything around me. And I can also see what they've got. I can see stone here. I can see gold here. I can see wood there. Um, food up over here in the Corinthians. So what this means is they all will obviously generate that resource in these respective locations. So for example, the, the number on the top is my current amount of food. And the number on the bottom is my amount of food that I will be getting next turn. You hover over any one of these and it gives you a very detailed breakdown of what exactly is contributing to that change next turn and the amount next turn based off of your total amount now and the change for next turn. So I, I like that very clear and cut out example of how you're getting all of these resources. Um, it can be convoluted in games in the past on how you're uh, garnering uh, uh, certain trade benefits and so on and so forth. So I do really like and appreciate that. But the interesting thing about these resources is that when I click on Menelaus and I click local recruitment, I can see exactly what is it costs to recruit these units, right? So I see that the upkeep for this unit is 100 food and it costs 730 food. That's just for one unit. These units change. So if I scroll down here, okay, this unit will cost me both food and bronze with only food to upkeep it. And as you progress through, you'll find more units will require different things. Maybe it's food and gold, or maybe it's food and wood, so on and so forth. 
that then extends over to the building queue, which you can see is very similar to Total War Warhammer. And if you have not played Total War Warhammer, I do apologize for making that comparison a lot. I think it's just the easiest one-to-one -one for a lot of people that are looking at this game right now. Um, but when we look at any of these buildings, we can see resource cost, 100 wood, 210 um, food. But if I look over here, this is we're going to require wood and stone. So you get a diversity of resource cost across your entire um, faction. And I really like that. I think it adds a little bit more granularity to the game that isn't just simply, okay, I'm going to jack up the max amount of whatever currency, gold, let's just call it gold in this case, um, I've got, and then I'm just going to use that to build. In this case, I have to really say, okay, I want a lot of archers, so I need a lot of wood. So I need to follow, focus on wood and bronze. Or you know what? I'm going to do just strictly um, infantry. Well, now I need some bronze and I need food. Or if I want to stick with um, any of the specific god temples, I'm going to need the respective resource that is required for it. So I like that you can kind of focus on this. And by looking at the map, you then have a clear cut target on where you're going to expand to, to then expand that resource. I really do appreciate that. And again, this is the colonize button, which we'll go over in just a little bit. So with this, though, we talked about influence. And if you look at this little menu on the lower left here, uh, you get population surplus, growth, happiness, and your influence. And the influence depends upon the tribe's predominant influence. In past Total War games, we've gotten specific religions. In this one, we're getting the actual tribes. So in this case, we're seeing that the Achaean influence is at 85%, whereas the Leligan, I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, influence is dropping at 15%. So that's what it means anytime you see an ability that says increases or decreases influence. And that extends to these respective little trade settlements. So the settlements will be geared around a specific resource. So take this one for example, it's geared around the stone mine. Now I look at the building browser, I get some resources, resource buildings that are relegated only to the stone mine settlement. So since this is a stone mine up to a quarry, up to a large quarry, I get access to the stone miners tents, I get access to the builders quarters, ore smelter, wall mountain, uh, a poika, e I know that's mispronounced, I'm sorry. Stonemason's Lodge. So these change depending on what you are looking at. Um, these two will always be the same, military and special, and ports will be only evident if you have a port. But um, even though these all change depending on the resource, they follow the same kind of underlying theme. So you're either going to get just plain resource plus a resource bonus if you have high influence. And this one you're going to get a large amount of resource but you'll lose influence and you'll gain an additional benefit that that resource confers so example minus two construction to time of all buildings and if i jump over here i look at okay this is going to give me a percentage increase to all resources and a percentage increase to the specific resource of this region but i'm going to sacrifice happiness and this one is just again a massive bonus to stone and a high influence bonus per uh, stone so again so the bonus of the resource plus high influence. And it just depends on what it is. Um, for example, we'll take a look at this location. Um, Edis is a ruined location. So if I click this button, Spartan Colonies, as I try to click it, I can see all of the ones I can colonize around me, right? And it's really cool. You can see that this increases the distance that it is from me. And it's not a significant increase. I mean, Edis is right next door, and that's three, one, and 500 wood, stone, and food, respectively. But Ios is just around the corner, and that only increases it marginally to up to this little, up to this amount. So let's just go ahead and do Edis real quick, and we will colonize this settlement. Yes, we'll spend that. And boom, we now get Edis. So like I was saying earlier, though, so since this is a um, food settlement, focusing on, well, food, it has the same kind of pattern that we talked about with the stone works. Uh, you're getting food and influence, or food and more food for higher influence. You're getting food and growth in this case. That, that's your, your secondary bonus as a result of this resource, but you're losing influence. You're getting resources and losing happiness. You're getting a lot of food and a lot if you have high influence. So it just depends on what, how you want to build out your small settlements. And I like this because it gives them a very set direction, right? 
Um, it typically, whenever you play Total War, it's always, okay, you're going to make a growth, an income, and a defensive building. And some variation thus of, depending on which one you're playing. And this way you can really say, okay, well, this is in the interior of my uh, faction. I just want three massive buildings that are going to massively produce tons of resources. Well, I can do that right now with this re these resource buildings. So, a fun mechanic there I really enjoy. Now, another cool mechanic here is the uh, ooh, ah, ah, the Royal Dec Decrees button. And this is, again, the way that you're going to be doing technology in Total War Saga Troy. And this pretty much will be based off of how you want to progress. Every single tree has got both military and non-military facets of it. So this is going to help me with bronze, food, stone, uh, timber, and then uh, gold. Effectively, as the icons kind of match up. But... If you notice this one, this is for light infantry. This one's for medium infantry. This one's for heavy infantry. This one is for skirmishers. I believe this one was for cavalry, or is it just purely civic? I think this was the only one that was purely civic. This has to do with a lot with happiness and construction time reduction. So you can get bonuses depending on how you want to play, depending on where you're going to focus. Like, okay, we, we've got um, a lot of medium infantry units in our army because we're spartans and that's a huge focus of our military so let's just go ahead and focus down all the way here to might and get all the bonuses for medium infantry right out the gate so you can really see how choosing these specific decrees is going to help you out in how you're building out your armies or maybe taking advantage of resources you lack or have a lot of depending on however you really want to do it so i like that the resource tree here is again a very thematic in the same way we got for three kingdoms and also very straightforward here there's no kind of cutting between the lines here it's it's outright you know exactly what's going on now the other little portion here is the divine will which is a pretty interesting mechanic so you get um four different stages neglected much like myself respected celebrated and then worshipped and as you build temples, you progress through the cult of these respective gods. Zeus, Ares, Apollo, Athena, Poseidon, Aphrodite, Hera, and even some that are not on this list that only your faction um, can progress towards or make uh, specific temples for. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, so as you progress through these, you can prayer or use the hecatomb. And this will increase your favor at a cost of money, right? You're making a food, I'm sorry, a cost of food. You're making a food sacrifice, a living sacrifice to this respective God. You select it, you click it, and it'll do the thing here, right? Shall we make the sacrifice in honor of the gods? Not now, fair sir. You also have prayer. So this will give you a specific benefit or bonus uh, based off of which God and where you are in the cult of that God. So for example here, this says, um, if I pray to Ares, we'll get a minus 10% to morale of all enemy units, enemy armies. So if I were to press this button, I would then get a little prayer going there, and it would cost me gold and food. But the benefit here is if I increase my favor, my, my progression in the cult, I wish I could lock that at the top of the right so I could hover over it with my cursor, but you can see eager to fight, delight for violence, and panic and terror. So as you move through these, the prayer will evolve and change and get better and you get better uh, attributes added to it as well. So eager to fight, plus one to local recruitment capacity, faction wide, and 40% to morale of sword and axe units. So depending on how you want to focus your campaign, you'll spend a lot of um, time in the divine will tree. And remember, you get a, fa a favor decay per turn of minus 10. So you have to kind of keep this up. It's a, it's a constant knife's edge that buildings will obviously help with. Let's jump over to the building browser real quick again. Oop. See all the different buildings for, you know, Hera, Zeus, Ares, Apollo, Athena, Poseidon, and Aphrodite. But you also get, and uh, right here we get uh, Dyke here, the veneration of Dyke, makes certain that in the final analysis, Sparta is treated fairly. So you get a favor of Zeus for uh, this gentleman. That's just f this specific faction gets that. So you also get the foreign encampment is the other special faction building here for Sparta. So I do really enjoy the progression system for Total War Saga, saga Troy, Total War Saga Troy, Troy Saga. Um, I think it's really cool. And I think it's taking a lot of the really awesome things about Total War Warhammer 2 and it's fine tuning them. 
Um, I think that when you take a look at this, through a lens, I see a lot of these things coming over to game three in a really cool and awesome way, right? Like I could easily see the divine will tree being attributed to the chaos gods in Total War Warhammer 3. Really awesome. So a lot of really cool mechanics. Um, you also get the call to arms thing like I was talking about. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and it shows you, okay, these are the factions that we are either at war with, or basically your, your diplomacy, right? Let me back out of that and jump right back into it. I can see, okay, so since we are allied with Mycenae, uh, Mycenae, we can get access to these units that they offer as a result. The Armored Swordsmen, the Agamemnon's Guards, so on and so forth. So on and so forth. So I really like this too, the Call to Arms, the ability to kind of pitch in to other factions' unit, tree, unit trees and add them to your own. It really makes for a pretty exciting way to do things. Combat, though, is much of what we've talked about in the previous video, so I will leave that conversation there. Um, when you press auto-resolve, it jumps into this kind of cool little cinematic uh, situation where you get to see exactly what's going on, just like Three Kingdoms. So it's kind of a cool little way to show the auto-resolve while, while it goes through. We did, unfortunately, lose some uh, militia. But you get the same kind of options here, where you can um, get some morale benefits. You can kill, or you can you can ransom them off for some treasury, or you know take them on, Make increase them your uh, recruitment here. So, looking overall at at this game, I see. Also, I really like these. I've always liked this in all the games. The little kind of cinematic event icon I've always really enjoyed. So it's cool to kind of see how they've done the overly stylized. Greek way of doing this. I really appreciate that. So, again, to kind of really look at the UI elements, I enjoy how encapsulated it all is and how broken down it can be. Um, the world events thing is just right there. I can unclick it and it's gone. And I know you can do this in every other game, but for some reason, a lot of UI elements in other games just felt so obtrusive on the actual campaign map. I felt like for Total War Warhammer, it felt like it was pretty much this entire top eighth of the screen up there. Um, but we get a very nice little concise breakdown of everything here. I like the notifications button, how it's right next to the uh, end turn button rather than being on it and stopping you from doing your turn. And you can then turn on and off the notification settings just like you can previously, but it's a little bit more fluid. It kind of is one of the better things from the 3K or Three Kingdoms UI that I really appreciate being brought into this game. Um, see, there was another thing I wanted to... Oh, you can also like collapse this over here, but that doesn't, that doesn't really matter a whole ton. So, my impressions so far with Troy are, are pretty positive. Let's jump over to a further point in the game so you can just see a little bit more flesh out of uh, the campaign that I've been progressing my way through. So here we are at turn 17. Not a huge progression in as far as the campaign's overall scope goes, but I now have a pretty good idea of what's going on. And, like I said, I, I think my thoughts for Troy are far more positive than they were when I only did the battle. And the battle pace has slowed down, and I've learned that you really have to use some of the elements on the battlefield to your advantage. You have to be using the forests and doing a lot of flanking charges or slowing things down, pulling them through forests, because your character can move through forests easily. So that's something I really didn't expect when I was playing the battles. Uh, I will say, though, that that even being said, my biggest focus is still going to be on campaign over battles, much in the same way as it was for Three Kingdoms. I think Three Kingdoms had a really awesome mechanic with the duels, but I found myself auto-resolving almost every single battle in Three Kingdom, much in the same way I'm doing right now for Total War Saga Troy. I, I think the battles are, are cool and fun, but I think that the campaign offers such a cool, or at least better, experience in the battles that I'm just playing through the campaign map itself. There are so many aspects of it that I really enjoy. When we take a look at the diplomacy button too, we get some of the things that have come over from Troy. You can do the quick deal portion that was, I'm sorry, that was in Three Kingdoms. Quick deals that were in Three Kingdoms that you can quickly do military access. Okay, who has the most likelihood? Or I can do my defensive alliances. Okay, Argos is really hurting for it. So I do like that a lot of those really fine-tuned and nuanced elements from Three Kingdoms made their way into Troy. Um, and again, it tells me that this can be done in Game 3, which is exciting exciting for Warhammer fans. But I also like... Um, oh, here it is. Come in, my friend. There um, is much to discuss. I also get 
expanded diplomatic options, much like Three Kingdoms. Where, where is it? I can do barter agreements and single barter agreements. I can trade regions. Um, so a lot of an increased amount of diplomacy that just makes the diplomacy screen worthwhile again, I think is a really awesome part portion of Total War Saga Troy. I think that there's just so many really solid improvements upon the Total War Warhammer 2 platform in Troy that I think, like I said, my biggest focus is probably going to be in the campaign map. I, I find that I've been having the most fun here, kind of clunking through um, the Spartan colonies, the Call to Arms, the Divine Will is really fun over here. Like, here's, here's step two of uh, Zeus, by the way, Might of the Thunderbolt, melee attack of club units and missile damage of javelin units. Um, I like the way that the Royal Decrees are kind of set out. I think it kind of creates for a little bit more synergy when you're trying to decide which way you're going, because I think ultimately technology trees can be a very overwhelming aspect for a lot of players. So I appreciate that it's a little bit more, okay, well, I want to just do light troops and I'll figure it out from there. Like you, I feel you can get your feet wet in the technology without a bunch of analysis paralysis, which I, again, very much appreciate. Also, it's nice to have all of my faction effects and one easy thing up here over here. It used to be at the top here for like total war, Warhammer or a uh, 3k. It's just kind of nice. I can collapse those and get rid of them. So ultimately my experience here of total war saga, Troy has been, like I said, many times so far, positive. I, I was really afraid to do this preview. I wasn't sure how it was going to pan out. I had seen some of the campaign gameplay on Total War's official channel, and I had seen the resource breakdown and everything, and I do like how the resource um, resources aren't so prevalent everywhere. You do have to kind of range out or at least make trade agreements to get more of those resources, again, much in the same way like you did in Three Kingdoms. So I do appreciate a lot of those things. And I'm very curious to see how this game will progress. Clearly, we're obviously still in the, the final stages of development. The game's coming out on the 13th of August, 2020. So we will see how this progresses in the next coming weeks. Well, remaining month of uh, uh, preview time and hopefully we'll get another hands-on preview closer to release. But to follow this video up, we'll be talking about Paris and I'll be doing less of a breakdown of each of the individual elements on the UI and more of a breakdown of Paris himself since we've covered them here now in Menelaus. But go ahead and let me know in the comments section below what you're feeling about Troy after you've now seen a ton of coverage and preview events with this embargo being released here today. I'd love to kind of get an idea for how you guys are feeling about this. Do you want to see more Troy content on the channel? Are you actually excited now that the game is coming out as opposed to where you were a couple months ago with just the first preview? Um, I will say, like I said, I am more excited. I'm not over the moon but I still think I'm in a better place than I was a couple months ago where I had a pretty negative uh, thought of the game. So I will say that up front. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Um, as always, go ahead and leave a comment below, like, subscribe, all that kind of fun action. And if you do subscribe, please go ahead and hit the bell button and turn on all notifications. You can find out when I'm streaming, when I'm doing game giveaways, any of the guides I'm gonna be doing for Total War Saga Troy. You can bet your ass I'm gonna do them. <laughs> but as always, have a good one and take care.